It's a pleasure to be here in the conversation cycles of the International Association for Semiotic Studies. Uh, my name is Maria Collier de Mendoza. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianópolis. Today we have the pleasure to have the guest speakers Bob Logan and Uli Gretzel. Bob Logan is a professor at the University of Toronto and Uli Gretzel is a professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, I'd like to present the biography of our guest speakers. Bob is a PhD in physics from the MIT. He began uh, working as a professor at the University of Toronto in 1968 he is now current, uh, a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. Since 2007, uh, Logan has also, worked, uh, has also been working as the chief scientist at the Strategic Innovation Lab at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. And his collaboration with Marshall McLuhan started when he um, the, uh, taught the course on poetry of physics uh, at the University of Toronto and his re research uh, in media ecology and the evolution of language. He's the author of several papers and the following books, The Alphabet Effect, The Sick Piece Language, Learning a Living in the Internet Age, The Extended Mind, of language, the human mind and culture, understanding new media, extending Marshall McLuhan, the poetry of physics and the physics of poetry, and what's information. Uli Gretzel is a PhD in communication from the University of Illinois. She is the current director of research at Netnographica, an innovation research company. She is a senior research fellow at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism in the University of Southern California. Her research focuses on human technology interactions with an emphasis on credibility perceptions, information search and processing, smart technologies, online and social media marketing, adoption and use of technologies, among others. She has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and co-edited books on social media marketing and smart tourism. And my name is Maria. I am a PhD in communication and semiotics from the Pontifical University, Catholic University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Sigma Lab in the graduate program in knowledge engineering and management of the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianópolis. My research focused on applied semiotics, branding, design thinking, knowledge media, and motherhood in media. I have worked more than 20 years in qualitative research, advertising, and brand strategy with multinational clients in Sao Paulo before becoming an academic. And I'd like to introduce our speech of today, and then Bob will talk. Uh, the word medium in singular and media in plural comes from Latin and it means middle. How can we explain media through the semiotic planes? This is the key question of today. As seen through Peirce's lens, the meaning of words grows according to how we use them because words are signs and a sign is something which stands for another thing to a mind. In this sense, during recent decades, the meaning of media has diversified intensely. And that's what we will approach today. In this conversation, we will begin approaching McLuhan's contribution to media studies with Bob Logan. And then we will discuss the impact of smartification on the current media ecology with Uli Kretzel. After that, we will present uh, related studies to media and semiotics that the three of us have been developing together to illustrate our academic experience with these issues of today. So uh, first of all, uh, we will start with Bob Logan. 
with the presentation Media as Seen Through the Lens of Mark Lujan's Media Ecology. Bob, now it's your turn. Welcome, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Ah, bon obrigado. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Buenos dias. Bon dia. Good morning. So I want to thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. I am not a semiotician, I'm a physicist. But as a result of teaching a course called the Poetry of Physics and the Physics of Poetry, when I wanted to bring science to the humanities students, um, I became uh, to the attention of Marshall McLuhan and he invited me to have lunch, and that began our collaboration. At that lunch, he said to me, Bob, what have you learned from the poetry of physics? And I responded that I was fascinated with a book written by Joseph Needham called The Grand Titration. And uh, Needham was uh, concerned about the fact that abstract science began in the West despite the fact that so much technology originated in China. Uh, examples of uh, technology from China is paper, ink, the printing press, uh, st the stirrup, uh, the noodle. So many things came out of silk. So many things came out of China. Why didn't they come up with science? So I propose that uh, since monotheism and codified law were unique to the West, and by the way, this does not mean that the Chinese were not spiritual or they didn't have law, but their law was not codified. So I said monotheism and codified law give rise to the notion of universal law, which might explain the Needham paradox. Next, please. So Marshall nodded his head in, in agreement and then asked me, what else did we have in the West that, that they did not have in China? When he explained that it was the alphabet, which was so obvious, but had slipped my mind because he was talking so fast and I was intimidated by this famous man, I let out a groan. But um, it's obvious because the alphabet serves as a model for analysis, classification, coding, and decoding. When you see a word and you want to write it, you have to first analyze the basic phonemes of that word. Let's take the word alphabet. Uh, a, a, you break down the basic phonemes that make up alphabet, and you code each of those phonemes with a letter of the alphabet. So you do analysis, you do uh, coding, when you read you do decoding, and it gives you a classification system. In languages that use an alphabet, it's very easy to make a dictionary. You put all the words in alphabetical order. In China, they have many different kinds of dictionaries. Some are by rhyming, uh, some are by the length of a word. They cannot alphabetize. So it's much easier to do analysis with an alphabet. Okay, next. Uh, so alphabet serves as a model for analysis, classification, coding, and decoding. Next. Taken all together, the alphabet promotes abstraction because the words that you write look nothing like the thing that they represent. Whereas in a language like uh, Chinese characters or Egyptian hieroglyphics, the shape of the word somehow resembles the thing that you are representing. Uh, the alphabet also promotes codification and classification because you can link things alphabetically and analysis. And these are the basic skills needed for abstract science and deductive logic. So, um, we came up with the idea that uh, 
the alphabet, monotheism, codified law, abstract science, deductive logic, were five ideas that began in the West. And they occurred somewhere between the Tigris Euphrates River, where that was the beginning of codified law. Monotheism occurred in, um, in Israel. Alphabet began in the Sinai Desert among the um, Canaanites who were coppersmiths. And abstract science and deductive logic began in Greece. And these uh, cultures, which lay between the Tigris Euphrates River and the Aegean Sea, were in communication with each other and they influenced each other. And so we believe that that phonetic alphabet, codified law, monotheism, abstract science, and deductive logic were ideas unique to the West originally and that they reinforced each other's development. This was a thesis of a paper that McLuhan and I wrote called Alphabet Mother of Invention. You all have my uh, email address. If you want a copy of that paper, just email me and I'll send you a copy of the paper. Next. So one of the central ideas of McLuhan's um, analysis of media is that media are extensions of man. That was the subtitle of his book, Understanding Media. Next. By media, McLuhan meant all human artifacts and tools and not just communication media. Uh, and how are they extensions? The hammer is an extension of the fist. The knife is an extension of the teeth. The lever is an extension of the arm. Clothing is an extension of skin. And electric media are extensions of our nervous system. Well, here's a picture of Marshall surrounded by TV screens. Next. By the way, when McLuhan used the term man, when he talks about extensions of man, he meant humankind, which back in his day was not considered politically incorrect as the case today. So let's not hear any criticism of McLuhan for using the term man instead of human. Now, with the internet, and especially social media and Google, there's been a reversal of media as extension of humans, which is that humans have become extensions of media that they use. How do we become extensions of the media we use? Well, with every keystroke that we use, I'm getting a phone call here, which is distracting me. Sorry, folks. With every keystroke that we make using uh, social media or Google, um, that information is captured by the app. And that data becomes part of the app. You see, an app is the, co the computer that uh, hosts it. It is the software. And then there's the data, which is all part of the system. So by scooping up our data and our information, the human becomes an extension of the app they're interacting with. So you folks out there, you're an extension of Facebook. You're an extension of Google. And what do they do with that information? They use that information to control you, to send information to you, advertisements. This was something that McLuhan prophesied way back in 64. He said, quote, in this electronic age, we see ourselves being translated more and more into forms of information, moving towards the technological extension of consciousness. So boys and girls, you are an extension of the media that you use. So be careful what you tell them. This is a beautiful image created by Maria. Thank you, Maria, for this. Okay, 
The idea of a global village is one of the key ideas in McLuhan's understanding of media. In Gutenberg Galaxy, he wrote back in 62, the electromagnetic discoveries have recreated the simultaneous field in all human affairs so that the human family now exists under the conditions of a global village. We live in a single constricted space resonant with tribal drums. Bum, ba, dum, bum, bum. The new electronic interdependence recreates the world in the image of a global village. And right now we are sitting in a cafe in our global village, interacting with each other and having fun. I'm having fun. I hope you are too. Uh, he returned to this the idea again in uh, understanding media. Today, after more than a century of electric technology, we've extended our central nervous system itself into a global embrace, abolishing both space and time as far as our planet is connected. And I enjoy being connected to you. I wish I could hear you, though. No feedback from the audience? Maria? No oh, we are hearing you. It's fine. All yes, right. there are 27 people connected in English and more people connected in another room with a Spanish uh, simultaneous tra translation. It's been... Ah. Yeah, you there are two rooms today. Espanol. <laughs> <laughs> today we have two rooms. Okay, muy bien. And, and once again, he came up with the same idea with Quentin Fiore. Uh, he said, ours is a brand new world of all at once-ness. Time has ceased. Space has vanished. We now live in a global village, a simultaneous happening. The new electronic interdependence recreates the world in the image of a global village. Positively, the effect of speeding up temporal sequence is to abolish time much as the telegraph and cable abolish space. So we have no more time. No, we have. Go on. There are I some more time. Good. Yes, yes. Go on. You denizens of 2020 are all aware that you live in a global village. But when McLuhan introduced the idea 58 years ago, it was brand new. And by the way, the term globalization was only... Um, coined three years earlier in 1959. So he was a real pioneer. As you'll see in the next section of my talk, McLuhan's understanding of media, culture, and communication is full of reversals. The idea of the global village is perhaps McLuhan's grandest reversal of all. When you consider that it was six, when you consider that he was basically suggesting that the whole planet reverses into a village. Okay, let's talk about McLuhan in reverse. McLuhan claimed that he did not have a theory of communication in media. However, in a book I've just written called McLuhan in Reverse, I claim that in fact, he had a general theory of media. I also believe that McLuhan's general theory of media and his success in developing a revolutionary way of studying media and technology and their impact is due to his use of reversals. Let's look at some of his reversals. Well, he always talked about the relationship of figure and ground. His most people emphasize figure. He emphasized the ground. You cannot know a figure unless you understand the ground in which it operates. He also reversed cause and effect. Most people talk in terms of causes. He was interested in effects. He was also more interested in percepts than in concepts. And when you talk about his famous one-liner, the medium is the message, he reverses the content, which most people thought was the message, to the effect of the medium independent of the message. That's what he meant when he said the medium is the message. That independent of its content, the medium has a particular effect on the users of that medium. 
he also developed towards the end of his life something called the laws of the medium, in which McLuhan asked, one, what does a medium enhance? Two, what does it obsolesce? Three, what does it retrieve from the past? And four, what does it reverse or flip into? In the fourth law, he once again makes use of a reversal. Let me illustrate the laws of the media with the following example. Let's take money. What does money enhance? It enhances trade and commerce. Um, what does it obsolesce? It obsolesces trade or barter, where people would exchange goods without using money. What does it retrieve from the past? It retrieves conspicuous consumption. When you have a, a, a pile of money, you can't wait to spend it. Back in the days when we were hunters and gatherers, when one family would kill a large animal, they would call for a feast and share the animal with all of their neighbors, and they would have a conspicuous consumption. So that's what money retrieves from the past. And what does it reverse into? Think about this, listeners. It's in your wallet. <laughs> what money reverses into is the credit card and credit. All right, let's go on. So McLuhan's uh, general theory of media, in addition to the laws of media, contains the following nine elements. His, his use of probes. He said, everything I say might not be correct, but it's worth thinking about. So all of his ideas were tentative. They were probes to see where they would lead. And for the most part, his probes turned out to be correct. Figure ground analysis, as I explained, you can't know a figure unless you know the ground or environment in which it works. The idea that the medium is the message that is, the medium has an effect independent of its content. Uh, four, the subliminal nature of ground or environment. People are unaware of the environment that a medium creates. And it's only revealed to them when an artist creates an anti-environment that explains the effect of a particular medium. Fifth idea of his is the reversal of cause and effect. The effect of the telegraph was the telephone. So the most important thing about the telegraph was not what caused it, but its effect. Its effect was that you could transmit information at a distance. And this influenced uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who by the way was a Canadian, to invent the telephone. Now, number six, he was more interested in the perceptual effects of a medium rather than the concept. The concept is about the content of the medium. The effect of the medium, independent of its concept, is how we perceive things. So people that use an alphabet perceive the world differently than people that use uh, a writing system, uh, ideographic writing system. And people that had writing saw the world differently than people that were in the oral tradition. Uh, therefore, he had another important aspect of his theory, which was the vision of communication into the oral written and electric. By the way, we now have a fourth division of communication, namely digital, which McLuhan never lived to see. Number eight, the notion of a global village, which we are now interacting in. Number nine, media as environments. Namely, that a medium creates a new environment in which people operate, and therefore the field of media ecology. 
Thank I did you. It. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you, you for much. listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. I hope no to meet way. you all someday in Brazil and Colombia. <laughs> Please stay here. We have a debate in the end. Now we are going to listen to Uli and then I will speak. Thank you, Bob, for this great conversation. My pleasure. Uh, so um, welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to um, uh, be part of this group. I, I had no idea it existed and I'm, I'm glad that I finally know about it. So my name is uh, uh, Ulrike Gretzel, but everybody calls me Uli. And uh, Maria asked me to talk about media as seen through the lens of smartification. And smartification has uh, really become a big part of uh, the discourse in many areas, um, like uh, city development, like tourism. And uh, so I'm going to uh, say a little bit about uh, uh, smartification and, and its meanings and uh, its relationship to media. So next slide, Maria. So where does this uh, word come from, or this concept come from? Um, originally, it was linked to the uh, smart development goals. And uh, so it was really about uh, rethinking governance, uh, rethinking sustainable development, and kind of envisioning a utopian version of this world. Uh, where are we heading? Um, and so this, this notion of smart was really linked to development. But then as happens in many areas, um, it became kind of like uh, taken over by corporations and IBM uh, is to blame here uh, for really um, hijacking the concept and making it all about smart technology. So uh, IBM has this concept called the smarter planet and uh, uh, they think that smart technologies, so that those are technologies that can actually learn. Um, and so there's a feedback loop in these technologies, like artificial intelligence, like smartphones, um, like sensor technology. So Smarter Planet from the IBM uh, point of view is about using our technology heavily to kind of create this technological uh, utopia. But uh, overall, uh, I think the, uh, the two now have merged and, and smartification now means um, really the connection of everything. Um, everything becomes uh, a medium, like we just heard. Um, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just about communication media, right? And um, uh, that there is a, that we need to create a diversity and abundance of data and uh, that uh, we actually allow this data to flow freely. Um, and then we need some ways of processing that data. So artificial intelligence is now seen as the way to process, optimize, uh, and also help with the communication of this uh, data. So we see that um, um, it, it is the technology that now um, creates these data flows and, and creates these connections. Next slide. And here's an example of uh, how that might be implemented. So um, I actually lived in Australia for five years and I, I have been involved in a project called uh, Sense-T in Tasmania. Tasmania is that little island uh, in the south of Australia. And uh, Tasmania has decided to basically turn the whole island into this sensing uh, medium. So they have employed uh, little sensors that can record all sorts of um, data and can communicate that data uh, to other uh, systems um, throughout um, the, um, the environment, uh, but also throughout organizations in Tasmania. So next slide. So you see here, for example, one application is what they call bloom alert. Uh, so in, in Tasmania, in some of the lakes inland, um, the algae can take over and you can have an algae bloom, which is of course um, bad for um, 
fishery is bad for the animals in that lake. And uh, so what Tasmania has done is they actually have turned these lakes in, into these sensing um, uh, media uh, that also communicate about their own state. So they're full of sensors and they now tell uh, these um, uh, alert um, uh, systems that uh, if there is an algae bloom. And this is also linked to satellite imagery. So now we are even extending this notion of smartification beyond Earth. It's not just a smarter uh, planet, right? It's, it's a, a smarter universe where uh, we have these satellites now also communicating with these systems in Tasmania. Next slide. So when we think about uh, smartification, it means, um, let's start at the bottom here of, of this um, uh, diagram. It means that we link uh, the physical layer of uh, our environment with technology, with these smart technologies, cameras, um, uh, temperature sensors, um, wireless uh, technology, RFID tags, you name it. From that, emerges this data layer and uh, that feeds into um, the governance so hopefully um, you know there's there's someone there who regulates it who creates supports these data flows with the idea and we just uh, learned from bob that um, uh, you know this this the way we think uh, creates invention, right? So with the idea that all of this creates innovation in the business layer. So businesses are then creating value uh, based on um, this, this new information. Um, and that feeds into human experiences. So at the top, uh, we have people uh, consuming um, these value propositions that the, the business layer provides. But then as we heard from Bob, these uh, people are also becoming extensions of media, right? And so in a smart system, in a smart ecosystem, uh, humans are also data creation um, points. So they, uh, just by walking around, because they trigger these sensors uh, by using the smartphones, by using uh, specific applications. They feed data back into the system. So we have uh, a loop here of uh, data flowing. Next slide. So how do we uh, um, also explore the connection between um, smart branding and media semiotics? So. Uh, I said there's a discourse around uh, smartification, but there's also actual branding. There's, there's uh, very much a, an effort to communicate about smartification. And this is important because smart development uh, demands the mobilizing of resources. So it requires persuasive communication. You need these actors, the businesses, the government uh, agencies, as well as the humans who are going to be in that experience layer. They need to be persuaded that this is a good thing and that they um, should uh, participate. And uh, so smart development uh, requires significant buy-in from diverse actors and so we we um, create this buy-in through meaning making um, and then also um, in order for that meaning uh, to make sense we or and and that commitment uh, to be uh, you know profound right it requires a communication of a vision of this utopia of what will be uh, the smart planet and, um, and because this smart planet idea is very complex, it also requires storytelling. So we see here that uh, smartification cannot um, proceed without uh, these kinds of branding efforts. Next slide. So what are brands? They are uh, intangible assets, right? That, uh, uh, produce distinct images in the minds of the stakeholders. And uh, so 
if we want to create brand equity, uh, which is the value uh, of a brand, um, we really have to manage the, the meanings, the, uh, um, the, the designs, right, that are associated uh, with the brand like that. So smart brands function as a framing device um, and uh, they very much feed into this overall technology driven uh, smart discourse. And uh, they promote what uh, some people like Vanolo have called smart mentality. Uh, so now we start thinking in terms of smartification. So an, uh, an example, uh, is this uh, IBM uh, Smart Planet branding. You see here IBM has branded the hell out of uh, this idea of smartification. And uh, uh, if you have a look online about the branding campaign, they specifically said that it should be a bright, bold, simple, approachable, visually arresting, iconic illustration uh, that could be understood all around the world. So uh, they have taken the symbol of the smart planet with the Wi-Fi uh, uh, beams coming out into all these other areas of life, like our agriculture, nutrition, um, and so on. Next slide. So then Maria also asked me to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what, what does this all mean now, right? Uh, we have a pandemic. Uh, how is this affecting smart activities and, and this media environment that we are creating, this new, new connected uh, uh, smart environment? So smartification, as I said, requires huge investments and the pandemic is definitely draining resources away from that, right? We see that governments are now spending in terms of uh, uh, health, uh, in terms of uh, um, yeah, um, supporting um, uh, people who, who need uh, to pay their rent and, and all of this. So uh, potentially that might uh, hinder smartification efforts. But at the same time, we've also seen that uh, COVID-19 has really driven that uh, smartification agenda forward. And uh, so I'm going to uh, tell you about impacts on the infrastructure level, on the data level, as well as the use kind of needs level. Next slide. So in terms of infrastructure, uh, Connectivity is really what we need, and uh, um, I'm not sure how much this is a, is a topic in Colombia, but in most of the world, that connectivity is now driven forward by the 5G adoption agenda, so a faster internet that can support this connection of everything, the internet of everything, right? And uh, it turns out that this internet of everything is very important for COVID-19 because it, it uh, fuels the touchless economy. So all these uh, things like uh, autonomous uh, delivery robots, um, cleaning, uh, disinfecting robots, all these kinds of technologies need uh, 5G connectivity. Uh, so in many ways, um, also the pandemic, a lot of things were closed. So uh, the telecom organizations have um, um, really um, taken advantage of the pandemic to move that 5G agenda forward. Next slide. But at the same time, I don't know if you heard, there were lots of conspiracy theories, right? So 5G uh, has now taken on a different meaning. Uh, 5G is now the enemy for uh, a lot of people. But there's also um, some legitimate concerns about 5G that uh, have, have really uh, raised health concerns and an anti-5G activism agenda. Um, so... So people actually see this as a big experiment that they have not consented to. So I've uh, put in a, a screenshot there of a video uh, that these activists have produced that uh, under the label, we do not consent. Um, but then also the pandemic overlapped in many places with this rise of new media activism. And so there, this fueled uh, people to actually destroy uh, telecom infrastructure in many places. You see here pictures of uh, the UK where people have attacked um, these um, 
antennas, uh, 5G antennas. So uh, if you're interested, we just recently did a study on new media activism. I've put in the link uh, here for the report uh, at Annenberg. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but we see with Black Lives Matters and all those kinds of protests that uh, happen, that smartification has also fueled opportunities uh, for activism that might um, uh, you know, actually hinder the smartification agenda. Next slide. Um, and, uh, and the big idea, the utopian idea is that uh, 5G and every, all the technology, the smart technology equalizes, but at the same time with the pandemic, we also see that it's really creating uh, an even bigger digital divide. So uh, if you've heard of students now um, not being able to get education because their parents do not have uh, internet at home or they do not have a laptop, so that is really a problem. Next slide. And uh, um, all this uh, pandemic um, need to actually track people of course, uh, has fueled uh, the, uh, the uh, innovation in that space. So we now have tracking apps. Um, they produce incredible amounts of data. So we see here smartification actually um, in action. But of course, there's also uh, lots of uh, critical stuff to think about, like privacy, uh, Uber valence, right? Surveillance at a, at a level that uh, is absolutely, um, you know, unprecedented. Next slide. And so Naomi Klein, of course, um, has also warned that we now have coronavirus capitalism and that some of this technological agenda is pushed forward and accepted actually uh, because there's this shock, right? Uh, and uh, we now actually have apps that would have been unacceptable uh, before. So we have to be very careful um, to not uh, make this uh, smartification um, kind of effort part of this coronavirus capitalism uh, agenda. Okay, next slide. And uh, the other thing that hinders uh, smartification efforts a little bit is that uh, a lot of the discourse around smartification is also around mobility, right? We, uh, it's about helping people move and then also they create data when they move. And it turns out that we didn't move very much during the pandemic. Uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, at least my husband and I still don't move very much. Uh, it's still too dangerous. And uh, we also have seen different media usage at home, um, but, um, but really th this notion of, of a smart city uh, has now become the notion more of a smart home uh, where smartification needs to happen. So um, we, we see here a tension, I guess, between those more global efforts and what is happening with the pandemic. Next slide. So the other thing that is happening is smartification because of that original meaning uh, with smart development, it does have a sustainability agenda. So it is about energy use optimization. It is about green computing. It is about supporting the circular and the sharing economy. Well, no one wants to stay in an Airbnb anymore, right? No one wants to uh, have secondhand clothing because of the virus. Um, and also the COVID-19 reality is that we are now throwing things away. We create uh, huge amounts of garbage. And this touchless economy is also creating electronic waste um, that is unprecedented. So in many ways, uh, the pandemic is also interfering with the smart development in that way uh, because the environmental focus has been lost. So thank you, Maria. Thank you very much, Uli. This was a great presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bob. Now I'm going to talk about, uh, as just to remember, if any of the people that are listening us is listening for the first time this cycle, this cycle uh, is um, initiative of the Association for International Studies in Semiotics 
and they have gathered a group of early career semioticians that Jorge is helping us a lot. He's here with us. He's a professor from Colombia. And now we are gathering together, discussing lots of things. And then they invited me to promote this conversation with Uli and Bob. And today I'm going to talk about, we have a very experienced professor here, that's Bob, with lots of very cool stories to tell us. We also need, we also have a senior professor, that's Uli, and an early career researcher, that's me. So I'm going to talk about uh, what's going on now, what I'm going, what I'm doing right now, and where do I come from first. So what's the context of my current research? The exponential growth of social media and digital technologies has brought significant transformation in social, political, economic, marketing, and cultural environments. For these reasons, we have changed the way we produce, buy, and consume a, a variety of products and services. As Uli was telling us right now, with the pandemic, this has also become bigger. We have also transformed the ways we connect with brands through media. And I am exploring how to apply semiotics and design thinking in brand management research, considering complex consumer environments embedded with social and mass media. I'm working with interdisciplinary literature from the fields of branding, marketing, design thinking, and applied semiotics. My project aims at collaborating with better systematization and dissemination of applied semiotics within knowledge media and branding studies. I'm currently at the knowledge media area of the program, the graduate program in knowledge management and engineering at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. It's worth mentioning that my trajectory I have started as an advertisement prof uh, professional in the market in advertising agencies and worked for 20 years as a planner, as a qualitative researcher in Sao Paulo. Then I moved to the academic field. So in my PhD and masters, I have focused on social and cultural symbolic aspects of advertising analysis, combining applied semiotics with qualitative research. And in the last four years, I'm connecting applied semiotics with visual and cultural analysis of branding issues. So uh, it's interesting, as Uli said, branding for the marketing uh, point of view is a mental dimension. What the marketing guys are interested in, they are interested in making the positioning and the strategic plans for the brands so they uh, do the consumer monitoring research. So they want to know the impressions, the emotions, the habits, the practices, experiences, thoughts, and knowledge which circulate among consumers to understand brand performance and brand equity, basically. Now I'm going uh, to talk about design because my current research, I moved from the cultural side and the social cultural side of branding and advertising to the design side, which is much more physical and tangible dimensions. The designers are concerned and focus on information and expressions of brands. So they produce the graphic signs surrounding the brands, in the packaging, in the logos, in all communications. They do the visual identities of branding and the consumers see what the designers produce and they touch it as well. So what can semiotics do in this sense? Uh, semiotics works with the brand meaning. It's our mission to understand what meanings mean and how to make meaning. So I've been working with advertising analysis, analyzing with, with semiotics, product and packaging analysis, uh, also understanding what consumption itself means and scenario analysis, which means the semiotic mapping of a specific scenario like a paper that Uli and I did with Smart um, and Bob also. It was a, a paper, sorry, I'm sorry, I did not mention all the authors, 
It was Oli, me, Bob, and Richard. That's my postdoctoral supervisor. We did a, a paper, a conference paper on smart cities logos. I will show you some uh, uh, slides from this presentation. And then uh, we can do a deep dive in a specific advertisement or logo or packaging, or we can do this scenario analysis that we are going to show you today. So what have we done together? This is the three speakers of today. So we did this paper I was talking about on semiotic perceptions of smart cities graphic brands and presented in the ABC conference, that's the Brazilian conference in cyber culture. And he said Peras is my postdoctoral supervisor. And now uh, I will also talk about, uh, I mean, sorry, I will also talk about the pandemic journeys. That's a project we are doing now at Santa Catarina, inspired by Bob's thoughts. So Bob's not a co-author with us, but he has inspired us a lot in this project because we are saying that the global village is now our living rooms. And we are working with the ideas of media ex extensions of our body senses, space and time now in the social distancing time due to, to the pandemic. And we also did a project that Uli is going to show you uh, related to semiotic analysis of smart destination websites and published it in an academic paper last year. So uh, let's talk about the smart cities graphic brands first. Um, everyday life is mediated by a complex network of languages and codes which build signs of the world we live in. Ubiquitous communication involves several media and technologies to connect people and objects. So the understanding of emerging urban utopias, such as smart cities, cities for people and sensible cities, becomes a relevant issue for the exploration of semiotic perceptions of graphic brands. Just a second. Oh, Fabio. Fala baixo. <laughs> Sorry, my husband's talking to a lot. <laughs> the conversation we are joining. Uh, I'm sorry, just a second. <laughs> sorry, the global village is the living room, but the kitchen is the family room. <laughs> I was hearing them talking in Portuguese and I started getting confused. Let's go back. So the conversation we are joining. Smart city is a complex concept as keep thinking at all said. It has at least six dimensions, which are economy, people, living, governance, environment, and mobility. And there's also Yangel, that's a Danish architect that he says that first we shape the cities and then they shape us. I think that McLuhan said something like that when he said uh, all media work us over completely. And this is the same idea if we consider the city as a media, you know, and the smart city as a media. Because beauty, what does Gale says? He says that beauties and spaces are designed to, should be designed to human scale because we cannot interact with very tall buildings such as the skyscrapers. Uh, city planning must consider protection, comfort and delight in everyday life. So we should ban cars, be lively, act attractive, safe, sustainable, and healthy. And then Carlo Hatti from MIT says that the city should be sensible, which means a city which is able to sense and be sensible. That's very interesting. It has a lot to do with what Wooly was talking about before me. So the emphasis should be on the human, not on the technological side. The exploration of interfaces between people and technologies should take place in the city. And this should provide empowerment of citizens to provide a more livable and urban condition for all. And then there is the smartification trend of everything, which includes the smartification of cities too. Uh, because the idea to make everything smarter through the use of network technology is one of the defining trends in the recent time and a phenomenon of interest to consumers, company and policymakers, and the media. 
While it seems self-evident that the Internet of Things makes our lives easier, better, more advanced and all around smarter, we can also need to talk about how and what the smart word means because it's culturally constituted and it resonates with our beliefs and value system. And that's from the semiotic view is very important for us to understand this word in practice, in the environment, as Paul was saying. What was the gap statement for this paper and the research question? The gap. Uh, smart cities have been studied through a variety of perspectives, as we said before, but visual brand identities are still understudied. So how do graphic brands of smart cities visually and express and symbolically translate emergent urban ideals? First of all, we did a workshop conducted by Bob Logan and me in Toronto with graduate students at the Strategic uh, innovation Lab at the University of, uh, of OCAD, that's uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design. And after that, we did a semiotic analysis of smart logos with the students. And then we uh, worked on it later after the workshop. The four of us, that's me, Bob, uh, Richard, and Uli. And we presented the paper with the most frequent um, signs regarding to the smart cities logos, identifying uh, recurrences in terms of icons, indexes, symbols, including visual and verbal codes. This is our procedures of research. We did the uh, Google images search for the logos, then we did the workshop. We applied the semiotic guideline following to Lucia Santaella in the book Semiotica Applicada. In English, it will be applied semiotic. The book, she teaches how to do semiotic analysis. Then we explored three semiotic points of view. That's qualitative, iconic, singular, indicative, and conventional symbolic with the students. And then after that, with our, the four of us. And then the debate of meaning of the, the these uh, logos with the students. There is a video, you can watch the video of this workshop available at the S-Lab uh, website if you want. The full class is there. And some pictures of the classes here as well. And then there's, you can see the students and there were also other professors from the University of Toronto in the workshop and some uh, professionals from different institutions of Toronto also joined us. So as key finding, I would say that we found out that these logos had vibrant colors. And one of the participants said there was a sense of Metropolis, the movie. So I don't know if you are familiar with this movie, with a smile, sort of pop dynamism, diverse, fun, cultural, and also the idea of growth and prosperity, as you see here in the Andalusia smart city, you know, like these shapes moving up and livability, workability, sustainability, and the idea of complex networks connected, uh, such as different modes of transportations and systems which are fast and integrated. And then also the idea of Think City with the images of light bulbs, speech bul bubbles, and brains, like this representation of the Firenze smart city. Uh, but overall, people felt that most logos were too tacky. You know, like there was like the impression that technology was more important in the environment than humans because there were few human beings in the logos. And then they told us, we are so obsessive about technology, but the city is still about people. And the idea of interconnectivity, breathing and cooperating idea, the, and also the virtual protection of the environment, such as this dome of the smart city Australia. And in general, there was the perception of utopia, as Uli was saying, uh, a total integration of virt the virtual, the natural, the physical and the social and the technological spheres. 
when it's not so easy to make these things happen all together. So final remarks, the most frequent visual and verbal codes were mapped in thematic groups. Participants noticed vibrant colors, feeling of dynamism, growth, vivacity, connectivity, cooperation and productivity and prosperity. They also perceived signs referring to sustainability, such as green leaves or trees and the, the logos, protective domes of virtual environment, complex networks or integrated system, and think cities. Above all, they noticed the predominance of technological elements instead of human elements in the corpus we analyzed. Uh, so now Oli is going to present the paper we did uh, Oli, do you want me to go with the slides? Then you can yes. talk. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so just very briefly, uh, an, an overview of the um, semiotic analysis of smart destination brands that Maria and I published. Um, the uh, smart agenda is, is very important in the context of tourism. And in Europe, um, Segi Tour, the Spanish um, tourism organization uh, connected to the ministry is uh, very um, uh, advanced and, and has created a, a concept of, of smart tourism that they are pushing and they are pushing it uh, now also to Latin American um, destinations so I know that they have been talking to destinations in Colombia as well. Um, so we, we wanted to look specifically about this tourism context that usually is a very uh, hedonic, uh, a very um, human-focused, fun-focused uh, kind of environment, right? That's, that's why we travel. We want to experience a destination. Um, and we wanted to see how these um, efforts um, in, in the tourism space are being branded uh, to kind of create um, uh, this, this agenda around uh, smartification of tourism. So uh, next slide. What we really wanted to do was to explore how smart tourism branding strategies were implemented to communicate these values uh, that we associate with smartifications and also the benefits and the attributes that are important uh, for industry stakeholders to understand uh, through these institutional websites that were created uh, for the smartification agenda. And so this is a, a, a B2B, a business to business uh, kind of branding effort mostly. This is not about talking to tourists about uh, smartification. Next slide. So what did we do? We actually looked at uh, um, two um, distinct institutional websites that have been very powerful uh, in Europe. And so one is the Spanish one, the Destino uh, Turistico Inteligente, and the other one is the European Capital of Smart Tourism uh, website where the European Union is now giving awards for smart tourism uh, efforts, right? And uh, so what, what did we find? Um, both websites communicate um, brand logos, but also feature website design that really conform with this uh, technology agenda. And we call it the Google aesthetics. Um, bold primary colors on very, uh, you know, white backgrounds. And so, um, the branding agenda here was really to connect smartification uh, through the brand to this post-digital era and uh, expressing very complex brand concepts in a rational and aesthetically clean manner. And both brands also signified progress, right? Progress through the design options as well as the keywords and the slogans used. So that was very um, um, prominent. And uh, um, the Destino Turistico Inteligente also communicates uh, about smart tourism as a development plan, right? As something that needs to happen. And uh, it presents that through infographics, through roadmaps um, to communicate um, uh, this, this kind of development agenda. Whereas the European Capital of Smart Tourism suggests 
uh, that it is an achievement, right? That we can already see um, what, um, what happened and that we can award things. Next slide. Uh, and so just briefly, what, what came out of this, and I really encourage you to look at the paper because Maria did some amazing graphics in there too. Um, but what we found that the brand elements and the digital communication codes uh, are used to express technology-focused, a progress-oriented uh, smart development agenda really to motivate uh, these stakeholders to commit uh, resources. And um, they communicate very particular notions of smartness, uh, so technology-focused smartness. Uh, and the findings also hint at the need to educate and establish credibility for smart uh, initiatives. We found a lot of signs that hint at this establishing credibility. And uh, that uh, the branding is optimized for the digital spaces and it also uh, integrates um, design elements, especially the aesthetics that are native to the digital space. And we really um, wanted to understand the meaning making potential and we saw that designs are very important uh, for smart developers and marketers to support the process and that the materiality of design and the potential of brands uh, really render this, this smartness tangible. It's such a complex concept that uh, the branding efforts are really uh, trying to make it something that is understandable and graspable. I was just saying that it was a challenging paper, but we had a lot of fun doing that together, right, Uli? <laughs> it was very nice. Yes. So now I'm going to briefly talk about a current project that we are doing here. Uh, Bob's not one of the co-authors, but he was the one that inspired us to take, uh, uh, how can I say, a McLuhan's uh, look through what we are now living during uh, the social isolating period. So uh, we were here in the beginning of the social isolating time. Uh, our university is a federal university, which means it's public, publicly founded by the government. And we had to stop the classes. We suspended everything uh, because we had to take some time to readapt to the online uh, teaching uh, system. And while we were adapting, we had this idea to do the project on the pandemic journeys with media and knowledge because we had started the design thinking course with the students, the four people which you, you see the names here, that's Professor Fialho, Professor Luciani Fadel, Professor Richard and me. And what happened is that the students were very excited about the course. Then suddenly the pandemic came and they had to be alone. And they did not want to stop, but we had to wait for some time for the university to decide how we would be able to cope with the, the online system. The university is huge. The, the, there's lots of students and they need to study how to do that. So while we were on pause, uh, we were talking about our routines, Luciani and me, in an informal conversation. And we were talking about what we were doing at home while we could not go out. And then she told me she was taking, attending to some classes online. And I told her I'm doing my Pilates online as well. And then we, we just had the idea that we are learning lots of stuff together and how to do new things together like this event of today. And this pandemic came in a very unpredictable way, but we had an opportunity to you apply design thinking tools to understand how we were communicating with each other and how we were doing our work and domestic routines now. And what had changed in this context, approaching specifically knowledge and media studies. So we invited the students to volunteer in this research experience. And then I will show you preliminary results because this, uh, this study is ongoing now. Uh, we, not, we did not finish it yet. 
And the idea is to look at ourselves in our homes and how our routines with media and knowledge has changed. Basically. Uh, okay, I've just said that. So how we are interacting with other, which is other, what has changed? Uh, we applied three design thinking tools which are the persona, the empathy map, and the user journey map, and ask the students to participate in this qualitative research field. And then we record a video of our new routine scenes with the research team that's, that includes 13 students. Our goal was to explore how the communication was taking place and how our routines with media and knowledge were taking place. We asked each of them to make the experience with, with one activity. However, many things was, was going on and they, you know, like they bring a rich material and the beginning, this is the team, was this video. I'd like Manuela to show the video now for us and then I'm going to show you uh, some preliminary learning. Manuela, could you please, uh, I will stop my screen sharing. As you can see in the scenes, we have uh, pick, uh, parts of every student and every research participant. And what have we learned from that? What are we learning from that? Uh, uh, I'd like to talk about what we have learned and I'm, I'm going to show you the tools. Um, first of all, they wonder how we will balance work and family activities, home chores and childcare routines. Here you see our PhD student, Ricardo, and his son. You know, like how to do my PhD work and have my two kids at home at the same time. So it's very challenging. 
And then, uh, in addition, they have also mentioned sustainability and quality of life needs and have suggested the redesign of food packaging and food delivery services because we are making lots of garbage also. Packaging is media and it affects design ecology. In this sense, it's a topic to think about. Last but not least, our key learning was to understand how the media has been working not only as extensions of our bodies, senses and home environments, but also bringing the global village into our living rooms, such as we are doing today. At first, people were worried. So, oh my God, I need to survive. How will I be doing that inside my home? It was like a hurricane, you know? And in fact, we had a hurricane here in Florida at least three, two months ago. <laughs> uh, regarding education, all of us also had to learn a lot of new things. How to study, how to teach online very quickly. In this sense, the media allowed us to create and share new knowledge in order to adapt to this pandemic context. Working from home involves fear, uncertainty, political and healthy concerns. However, when we think about what we have learned during the study, we conclude media was essential to provide us with the new conditions to move on. And with so many physical and biological limitations, McLuhan's work is essential for understanding what's happening to us individually and socially. You know, there is a quote from McLuhan that he says, all media work us over completely. They are so pervasive in their personal, political, economic, aesthetically, psychological, moral, ethical, and social consequences that they leave no part of us untouched, unaffected, unaltered. The medium is the message, as Bob Logan said. Any understanding of social and cultural change is impossible without a knowledge of the way media work as environments. And this project is focused on the here and now. It's already, you know, we did the first phase, but we are now continuing to discuss different topics with the students, such as education, working from home with kids, and all the topics that are coming up. Now I'm going to show you the tools. So Camila is one of our students, and she worked with the sensation of information overload during the pandemia, as Professor Paolo Granata is saying. Um, this is the, the research uh, tech, uh, tool of the persona from Design Thinking. We describe who is Camila, what she likes, how she lives, you know, like her characteristics. And after that, each student did his persona or her persona. And then they did their empathy map to describe how they think, how they feel, what they said, what they did while they were doing the activity, what were the pains and gains of the activity. So you can see here some quotes and some feelings of them. And then after that, each student did his user journey map, which is the before, during, and after the activity, including what he or she was doing, thinking, feeling, the barriers and the insights they learned during the activity. So we have this rich material, we are working with them, and we will publish some papers on this project in the future. The study, now what we have learned is that the global village is now our living rooms, and all media has become extensions of activities we never thought we would be doing by ourselves inside our home, as you see in the video. Um, these are some references of today, the Abba Sieber paper and the Smart Destination Brands paper that Uli has presented, if you want to read it. Uh, the workshop Bob and I did in Toronto is available in the S-Lab website. I can send you the link uh, later. Now we have the debate. I'd like to uh, ask the audience to send the question that Manuela and Jorge will send me, and I can ask you and Uli and Bob. Uh, I have a first question for Bob. Uh, could you please, Manuela, uh, switch Bob and Uli's microphone on? Están en las preguntas en el chat. En este momento hay unas en inglés. Eh, 
las puedes observar y ya entonces paso a la sala de Meet para mirar si hay alguna pregunta allí. So, for Bob, what was McLuhan's greatest contribution? His greatest contribution was um, bringing systems thinking into the understanding of media. And for Uli, what are the implications of conceptualizing smart cities as media? I think it raises some really important questions about um, who communicates in a system like that. Um, and uh, we also have to now understand that we have increasingly non-human communicators in a smart system. And uh, what are the messages and uh, to what and to whose benefit are they communicated? And uh, I know that some of you are already thinking about the digital divide um, in, uh, in Brazil, for example, or, or in China. And I think those are really important questions we need to ask. Whose benefit? Yes, here at our university, for example, we felt the need to stop classes for three months to understand if it was feasible to continue online learning because we have many students that are poor. They needed support for internet access, you know, high speed internet access. Some of them did not have notebooks and have only prepaid phone uh, plans for mobile phones. And um, I can see here a, a question from Paul Cobley, uh, and he's saying that it occurs to me that there is a key semiotic concept that unites the three presentations today. Rather than thinking of signs being somehow wilded or manipulated by independent humans in the fields of branding, media and smartifications, are we not talking about the way in which human systems extensions of the sensorium trading exclusively in sites are constituted by semiosis. That is to say humans are not pre-constituted entities that use signs interplanetary, but rather humans actually are the signs that they use in the sense that the sign system are cognitive and often physical, which is part of the cognitive too extensions of humans? If so, then the key semiotic concept is that of unveiled. Also, if the, in this case, then Maria suggests that the emphasis should be on humans, example, the smart city design entails the unveiled theory is essential to questions of sustainability, human living, pandemic management, and other compulsions to altruism. Even if utopian that we should heed agree i'd like you to ask to do you understand the questions i don't know if i read it well could you comment on that Oli and bob please i'm ready to comment <laughs> please go on <laughs> okay first of all it was a very long question <laughs> more of a statement than a question <laughs> but i will respond in the following way um The emphasis has been on smart. In the English language, smart can also mean uh, mustard is smart. I'm now going to be a smart aleck. So smart can cut both ways. Um, now, In addition to smartness, which is important, that's information, we also have to talk about wisdom, which we haven't raised in this discussion so far. Uh, we have something called artificial intelligence, but there's no such thing as artificial wisdom. Um, because our computer has no values. The values are only the values of their programmers. So we have to do better than just rely on being smart, relying on artificial intelligence. We have to think about being wise. 
let me make a breakdown between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Data are the facts. Information is the data that has been contextualized, giving it more meaning. Knowledge is the ability to use information to achieve our goals. And wisdom is the ability to choose goals consistent with our values. So we have to think about wisdom as well as being smart. I'm being a smart aleck right now. <laughs> yes, uh, I agree. So um, uh, Maria and I, when, uh, for both papers, we kept saying, we're the humans. Uh, it's all about the technology. Why are we not talking more about the humans? And uh, I know Maria uh, Del Carmen uh, also asked in the, in the chat, what are the implications uh, for you know, humans here? And uh, that's really what's important. And relying too much on technology we know is not going to make us um, particularly smart, right? Uh, technology is not great. make us wise. Yeah, it, it doesn't make us wise, exactly. Uh, it, but um, on the other hand, we, we see that technology can take away some of you know, our burdens and, and help us be creative. If you look at the internet, uh, thank God, uh, even now during the pandemic, we, uh, we saw so many incredible um, human things happening from pandemic humor to, um, you know, these new connections. I, my husband and I, we've been taking virtual uh, cooking classes on Airbnb. And so we've been cooking in, in Singapore and then in, in Bali and in Thailand. And it's absolutely incredible. Uh, but yes, uh, the value system, this is what we need to think about because all the surveillance, all the, the, the uh, privacy issues, all the uh, uh, digital divide issues, those require uh, answers that can only be based on values, right? And so we, uh, we need that wisdom and, and people are now already in academia talking about the wise uh, city uh, as the next step beyond the smart city. So, uh, but how do we, um, you know, bring that in? Uh, that's the big question. We have to be wise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the corporations like IBM are very powerful and they keep pushing that technological agenda. So I think we, we there needs to be someone who pushes the human agenda. There's yeah. a dangerous idea out there called the singularity. Yes. Yeah. Singularity is the notion that an artificial intelligence computer will program the next computer, and that computer will program the next computer until we get a computer that's smarter than a human. This is a hoax. It's ridiculous. It's not possible because computers have no feelings, no emotions, no desires, no cares. So uh, values are so important to talk about and think about. And uh, the technology is only the assistant. It's not the end. It's just a means. So let's talk about the semiotics of wisdom. Yes, in this sense, what I would like to remember like Paul was talking about semiosis and in this project, the pandemic journey projects, what we have learned, uh, we were focused on not, we did not want to talk about new normal because we refused this idea. Normal means codification and, you know, it's in the thirdness dimension, prop, you know, because we have to define codes to consider it normal. It comes from the norm. We have no norm yet. We are adapting to a new reality. In this sense, there's lots of semiosis that we have been doing to live inside our home, to teach, to practice exercises and do cooking lessons through Airbnb, do a conference like this one, each one in our living room. And in this sense, that was our focus of interest, you know. So what types of new knowledge, what types of interaction with new media are we producing right now? 
so this is about semiosis. This is about semiotics because we are creating meaning. We are creating new knowledge through what we are living here and now. That was, I think in this way I have answered Paul. I'm going to look at the questions we have and make a summary of them so we can move forward on the debate. There is a question from Professor Roberto Chiacchiri. Uh, I have a question. I think Uli has answered that, but I will just say it here. How can all this contemporary technology help the most needy, vulnerable population? And I, I'd like to read some of the questions, then we can respond them. Let me check. Uh, well, one solution has been to create a a basic uh, information device, computer, uh, that's affordable. Yeah. The, uh, the MacBook Pro that I'm talking to you has more features than I ever want to use myself. And uh, they always make the technology is so cool to increase the sales. But there's, someone should be talking about creating a very affordable uh, information device that an ordinary person could afford. One more comment on normal. Human progress, the creators of beauty, were never normal. <laughs> I think another issue is that we, we speak of devices, right? And these are, these, so we, we put the, um, the obligation on the individual to acquire these devices. And without the device, you cannot be a citizen anymore, right? You cannot, uh, you cannot hold a job. Um, you, um, you cannot be a good parent because there's, you know, your school WhatsApp group. Uh, and so I think um, maybe we need to think about maybe thinking beyond the device, right? And so smartification in some ways also thinks about different kinds of interfaces. And, uh, and again, connectivity. Right now, we are so so vested in this idea of, of uh, radio waves, but um, they cause a lot of problems on the health side. Uh, and maybe we need to think about communicating uh, through light, and so I and and you know make that uh, find different ways to for information to actually uh, be accessible and, and appear. Um, or, or data to be, um, uh, you know, um, situated, right? And so I think right now we are very much stuck in, in uh, models that are being pushed by Apple, by uh, Verizon and all like um, T-Mobile, all, all the telecommunications companies. And we have to understand that this is big business. Um, and so we we need to maybe think about more um, um, civic engagement and more civic communities where um, you know, it, the people are, are in charge of creating um, these infrastructure. Um, yeah. I have a proposal for a research project. Mm -hmm. I invite everyone to join us. The project is wiseification. Great, great. <laughs> yes. I love it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's cool. talk about what, how do you create wiseification? Great idea, Bob. What so, is a wiseification device? <laughs> great. Now we can start with the Bible, <laughs> the Quran. We can start with uh, Lao Tzu, uh, Confucius. So what if we start to think about how we can uh, gather in one place the wisdom of all the wise people that lived on this planet. <laughs> and how do we transmit that kind of wisdom to the general population? Uh, in the United States, American electorate, the, the voters are not very wise. <laughs> they chose a fool. <laughs> I cannot talk I, something different from my country. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was going to say, something similar happened. Oh, elsewhere. my gosh. Well. So maybe we have to think about education as a form of wiseification. Yeah. And that education has to be more about values 
and uh, wisdom rather than knowledge. One of the things McLuhan talked about is children are bored in schools because they're gray at the age of three. They've already learned everything from television. And the teacher has nothing interesting to um, provide them. Now, school is important to learn some basic skills, reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? But in terms of social studies, the kids are, they think they know it all already. So uh, I think a wise vacation project is also about research into education, how we educate the young people. My generation, your generation, Maria, it's, we're over the hill. We have to think about the kids that are just coming up. Even the, the millennials and the Gen Z, Generation Z people, they're, uh, they're lost. <laughs> oh, I... About the, the babies. Yeah. They're the only ones on the planet that respond to positive values because they're not been polluted with the artificial values we have about consumption and status. They just interested in love. Great. <laughs> I'm well, a Jewish guy, but I mean, Jesus yeah. talked about love. <laughs> That's but if the we, vacation. If we listen to Elon Musk, the wisification is all about implanting technology into the human brains, right? So I think we also, um, uh, we really need to uh, think about ethics here and, yeah. um, uh, and what kind of, um, uh, yeah, who, who gets to decide on, um, yeah, what, what wisification is going to, to be. I about. would like to put into Elon Musk's heart. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, artificial <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because the heart is more important than the brain. Yeah. Empathy. Right? Yes. Um, I, I, I want a person with a good heart over a person uh, with a good brain. True. Well, I'm, I was told by Jorge that we are running out of time. So I'd like to say it was a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. I would like to thank again for Oli and Bob to be here with us today. And You're also to pleasure. all the team that organized this event and all the audience that participated with us. And to close the event, we will invite Professor Gladys. And also, I'd like to say, maybe if you want to sing happy birthday to Bob, he was 80 years old yesterday, so it's <laughs> still time to celebrate his New Year, that's starting today, right? Yes. So, could you please talk, Gladys, then we finish singing Happy Birthday to Bob. <laughs> thank, so, um, you. thank you, Bob. Happy birthday. <laughs> Profesores, a todos nuestros asistentes, a todos nuestros asistentes, muchas gracias por conectarse a las personas que estuvieron en sala también eh, de Meet, conectándose a esta conversación, a todos nuestros asistentes, muchas gracias. Pero quiero antes dar paso a la profesora eh, Gladys eh, Lucía Costa, que viene de la Facultad de Comunicaciones, profesora de la Facultad de Comunicaciones de la Universidad de Medellín, que ella también quiere dar su saludo. Eh, Sergio, eh, profesora María, ¿les parece como ella habla español? Le hacen la traducción a ella habla y profesora Gladys, puedes decir unas palabras y ya le das paso a Sergio para que él traduzca y ya entonces les dé los mensajes a nuestros invitados, ¿le parece? Muy bien, perfecto. Entonces decía que este es un espacio que un saludo pero sea esta la oportunidad para dar un saludo y también un cierre, pues una despedida y con la enorme gratitud a los eh, tres participantes, eh, al doctor Robert Logan, eh, a Ulrike y a María Kohler, ¿cierto? por sus valiosos aportes 
eh, con lo que nos han comentado en torno eh, a la semiótica como lente para leer esas realidades eh, de los medios, bien sean ellos los medios eh, tradicionales pensados desde Manlujan o bien sea ahora lo que se está pensando en el marco de las tecnologías de la comunicación y de la información. Y a nombre de la IAES y obviamente de la PELS, y a nombre eh, de Red SEMA, que es una red que emerge apenas, que recién, es una recién nacida, pero que tiene toda la vocación de crecer. Eh, les agradecemos pues a todos la presencia, pero antes quisiera eh, enunciar algunas cosas con respecto a lo que son los medios o cómo se están pensando los medios, las mediaciones y las tecnologías en nuestro contexto colombiano. Es una visión muy panorámica, muy rápida ¿sí? y por lo tanto simplemente quiere entrar como en, en el diálogo, ponerlo por lo menos en el contexto de lo que fueron sus magníficas presentaciones. Digamos que en Colombia los medios y las investigaciones en torno a los medios eh, siguen siendo ayer como hoy muy importantes. Eh, de alguna manera los jóvenes de esas investigaciones han estado en el campo de las ciencias de la comunicación, en el campo de las ciencias de la información, de la sociocrítica. Eh, sin embargo, eh, recientemente entonces se eh, aboga por procesos o por proyectos que involucran la semiótica en sus diversas ángulos y diversas líneas de trabajo. Eh, en el contexto nuestro, pues se ha ocupado un papel muy importante lo que son los medios masivos, eh, y de manera particular el vínculo de esos medios con las relaciones de poder y de control que ejercen, sobre todo y fundamentalmente porque los dueños de los medios son también los poderes económicos y por lo tanto ejercen ese tipo de prácticas que, que van aniquilando o van por lo menos eh, desquebrajando estas prácticas de democracia. Hay también, sin embargo, asuntos e investigaciones que hoy eh, emergen en, en Colombia y que tienen que ver con lo que ya ustedes planteaban. O sea, la mediación desde las pantallas, eh, en cualquiera de sus expresiones. Tenemos un amplio espectro, digamos, de, de, de reflexiones y de proyectos que indagan sobre los modos de interacción, los modos de intercambio comunicativo, y que hoy emergen en un contexto bastante eh, complejo, digámoslo no solamente porque hay miradas que son esperanzadoras en términos de eh, los vínculos con las tecnologías, eh, con la esfera pública digital y con esta emergencia, y hay otras miradas que apuntan más a predecir, digamos, eh, las capacidades, las enormes capacidades que van forjando también los procesos de manipulación, en contexto de posverdad, ¿sí? de pospolítica, o sea, también cómo los medios en última instancia aprovechan asuntos como los escándalos en contextos políticos para poder gestionar estrategias eh, de manipulación y, por supuesto, de propaganda. Eh, creo que son malos retos estos espacios que se abren como este conversatorio, pues constituyen sin lugar a dudas para nosotros eh, un escenario eh, de, de pensarnos, de repensarnos en términos de lo que estamos eh, haciendo e, e investigando. Eh, esta condición hace inaplazable un acercamiento a la pluralidad de ángulos semióticos que nos permitan ahondar, profundizar en esos vínculos que hoy se tejen desde las redes. Me llamó mucho la atención eh, en el la articulación que se hizo en la presentación de los tres, lo que fue la, el vínculo con la actual coyuntura del COVID. ¿sí? Y me llamó mucho la atención porque hace parte incluso de proyectos de aula que estamos trabajando con los estudiantes de semiótica que recién inician en este acercamiento a la disciplina para pensar las ritualidades, los modos de interactuar el tipo de emocionalidades que se están gestando eh, en contextos de contienda y cómo la mediación de pantallas ocupa un lugar muy protagónico. Esto es básicamente lo que quería compartirles. 
eh, nuevamente agradecerles y expresar a nombre de, de la IAS y obviamente de, de, de la PELS y de RedSEMA y de las instituciones que han hecho posible este encuentro, particularmente la Universidad de Antioquia, que ha sido bastante protagónica, eh, a las universidades que se han vinculado como la eh, universidad, la institución universitaria Salazar Herrera, el tecnológico, el, el Instituto eh, Tecno, Tecnológico eh, Metropolitano, pero también entonces la Universidad de Medellín, la Universidad Univit. Mil gracias a todos. Profesora, muchas gracias. María Collier, de pronto le puedes eh, traducir un poco los mensajes a nuestros invitados. Uh, Gladys was um, saying thank you for the conversation of today and thank the, the three of us. And she really liked it. And she said she is developing a project with the students that has to do with the screens and students, you know, the, how they are interacting with the media. And so she uh, has also talked about the semiotic studies in Colombia. I think I'm gonna just sum up this way. And now we can sing you happy birthday. I don't know what in what if it is in Spanish, if it is in English or in Portuguese. <laughs> Maybe we can make a mix. <laughs> And I also loved the conversation of today. I hope the conversation was also nice for Uli and you. I hope you like it. And also I hope everybody that is Uh, with us today also enjoyed the conversation I'm seeing through the chat they did it they like it so now I think to end a good conversation is like a conversation among friends we do not finish the conversation we stop because of timing right that's what I feel so yes <laughs> this is a very good sign we need to stop now because time is over and to stop now we are going to celebrate Bob's birthday and That will be great. So let's sing it. Let's Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Parabéns. Happy birthday. Yes. Happy birthday. I'm not going to sing, so. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Bye. So, yeah, to sing in the video is not a very good idea. <laughs> But you mean, what we mean is, Happy birthday. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody for staying with us and short time in this moment. So in this moment we are introducing with the, the next uh, converse, uh, conversation sessions. It's about the contemporary narrative. We are half invited for Ar Armando Silva, Jose Maria Pazgago, and Mariana Museta. So everybody uh, is um, invited in, in, this mo in this special moment. And so we'll, we see, we see them in the next uh, Tuesday, 10 a.m. in Colombia time. So thank you so much for staying here. Maria Collier, thank you, Ulri, thank you. Thank, thank you, Gladys. And we are so, so much happy to uh, join us in this moment, okay? Thank you, Bye. thank you, bye-bye.